That's right. right. Yeah. Uh, and before uh, winding up at, uh, at Washington, uh, so Luke is uh, uh, interested in um, understanding language, uh, and there's a lot of NLP tasks that are bound up in that. And uh, Luke has always kind of wanted to build an integrated theory of all those at once. I think, which is uh, uh, a project dear to a lot of our hearts. I think, and uh, we'll, we will get to that in later iteration. Thanks, Jason. Yeah, so not only do I want to understand language myself, but I also want to build systems that understand language. So let's see, let's see if we can make some progress on that. Uh, so uh, that was a wonderful introduction. Thank you. Also sort of fun for me, this is, I think, the first time I've been to the same seminar twice. So you were kind enough to invite me when I was a brand new baby faculty, and now it's been sort of seven years later. And you know you can judge, you know, based on all the amount of gray hair and so forth, you know what, what's happened since then. But hopefully, I'll also convince you that we've made some progress on building better models for doing uh, semantic analysis for text. Um, so before I forget, you know, these three bolded. This is, of course, collaborative work across even two different locations. And uh, Lu Hang, Kenton, and Matt deserve really the credit. And I'll try to make sure I point out as I go. But of course, a lot of people contributed. But the folks in bold were the leads on the main projects. And I'll try to, try to remind as we go about that. Now, the general sort of theme for the talk today is kind of thinking, rethinking the methods we're using for sort of broad coverage semantics. And so I'll think about SRL and COREF. And what I'll try to convince you is that we can simplify things. Uh, and actually make, make performance better. So simplicity is in the eye of the beholder. You can look at these networks and think they're really complicated, uh, but I'll try to convince you that relatively simple things are working way better than we expected for a lot of problems. Okay, so, so think about that as we go and see if, see if you agree with me. But before we get there, I'll start out with a meme. Okay, so I wanna try to frame a little bit what we're doing uh, with respect to kind of this cartoon view of how deep learning works. Okay, so, so three easy steps for success for your machine learning research or your deep learning research, okay? So, so what would step one be? I understand this is supposed to be an interactive audience, but I'll answer in a second if nobody wants Download to. Download the Okay, so you've got to get a toolkit, that's true. And what are you going to train it on? <laughs> Obscene amounts of data, labeled data, right? Input-output pairs. And of course, sometimes you have that, but sometimes you don't. So you can get data of various forms. You can do various things with it. Uh, what's the second step? And think about you know, media accounts here, not, not, not sort of science. It's very easy. You just apply deep learning, right? No big deal. Uh, of course, there are a lot of details to getting that right, the architectures. But more and more, this is actually becoming true. Like standard architectures are doing pretty amazing things. And we'll talk about that a little as we go. Uh, and what was the third step? So my, my was that? Exactly. Uh, so there is no third step. This is all super easy. Of course, this isn't really true, uh, but you could see this account, and you, it would be fun to think about how much is it actually true. And in specific, how much is it actually true for the kinds of problems that, that I think I care about and a lot of people in the room care about. So think about broad coverage semantics where you're clustering noun phrases into co-reference clusters, or you're taking a verb and you're trying to answer who did what to whom, where, so forth, and so on. Uh, you know, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but my, my sort of assumption is that if you could do this well, it would help many, many different applications. These are sort of core uh, problems. And, you know, the question we want to ask today is, you know, how does this meme hold up when you think about trying to apply it to these problems? Okay. So the first question you have to ask is, you know, can you gather lots of training data, labeled training data? Uh, pretty much no is the answer. I mean, so some great work on crowdsourcing it here and other places, but it's very difficult. Uh, you know, one way of thinking about this is to think about, for example, the Penn Tree Bank, which is you know a multi-hundred page annotation guide that requires a degree in linguistics and you know months of training to do the task. Of course, there's also really great information in that data. It's really useful. You know, it's absolutely crucial. But probably we're not going to get millions of labeled examples anytime soon. Uh, even if you're working on a very big uh, budget. So when I say broad coverage here, I just mean I want it to run on any input sentence you give it. It may or may not work well, but it will have some prediction for any sentence you give it. 
Yeah, that's great. Please don't be shy if there are clarification questions and stuff. If I'm using terminology, I appreciate it. OK, and then uh, applying deep learning. Well, you, we, it is happening all over the place, uh, but, but with a little bit of a caricature, mostly what's happening right now is we're taking this core NLP pipeline that we're really familiar with, sort of part of speech tagging, parsing, some kind of semantics, some sort of co-ref or discourse level thing, and we're kind of applying deep learning to each of the pieces. So we're taking all the stuff we knew how to do before and we're neuralizing each version and kind of doing the various things to it. Um, and as I'll show you later, that's great, but maybe it's not the best way to do it. So maybe there are other ways of thinking about it and I'll draw some contrasts there. So, so we're making some progress, um, but uh, and we are actually seeing gains, but the story is a little bit backwards from the meme, right? So, so we're, we're, we're neuralizing this stuff, we're, we're getting great models, we're seeing some gains, but we actually didn't do it by getting a lot of data and training really high capacity models. What we're doing instead is training high capacity models on the same amount of data. And that should make us a little confused and nervous about things, right? But nonetheless, it seems to be working and we'll talk about that. And that's gonna kind of be the outline for my talk here is actually we're gonna do this meme in reverse. So I'm gonna spend the first half of the talk talking about some models that we did on the same sort of relatively small data sets where we're gonna see some pretty nice gains. And then I'm gonna come back and say, well, wait, what about data? We got these super high capacity models now could we get even more data? Could we scale up? Uh, could we get these things to work much better? And there we don't have you know, a finished story yet, but we have some first steps, and this is a, a direction that I want to talk about more for the future, okay? That's, that's the outline of the talk. So in the modeling section, we'll talk about these two tasks that I've already introduced. And the themes that we're gonna see here uh, is that we're gonna do end-to-end -end training of a neural network. Uh, we're gonna use no pre-processing. So unlike the NLP pipeline I just hinted at, no part of speech tagger, no, 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 uh, no parser, nothing. And we're just gonna to try to train models that go directly to these end tasks. And we'll see that relatively simple models actually work you know, quite well in practice. Okay, so I'll take you through the two models at, at, at a high level and hopefully get you some intuitions and do lots of analysis of what's going on. All right, so the first problem of semantic role labeling, the idea here is that you wanna take a verb like broke and you wanna hook it up to all of its arguments and adjuncts and say basically who has done what to whom and so forth. Um, you can contrast this with syntax. So in the syntactic situation, this mug could be a subject in one sentence, an object in the other sentence, but if you're doing more of a semantic -y level analysis, in both cases you wanna recognize that it's the thing being broken, right? And more generally, we wanna be able to look at all the different spans that are related to the verb and kind of label their relationship to the verb. Uh, throughout this talk, I'll mostly focus on prop bank uh, kinds of roles. So these roles are verb specific. If you look over here, you can look up for the verb, verb break. You know, the arg zero is the breaker, the arg one is the thing being broken and so forth. Uh, and hopefully the methods I, I develop will be pretty agnostic. They won't matter too much what these roles are, but I haven't actually shown that. And we've run mostly on prop bank so far. For example, thinking about how proto roles and other things could be predicted is really interesting. I'd love to talk to people about that later today. This is by no means the right set of roles, uh, but it's the ones that we're predicting right now. Uh, and so if you did the prop bank roles in the sentence, it would look more like this, arg0, arg1, arg2, and so forth. And I'm just putting those up because you're gonna see those labels later. Uh, so what we're trying to do is for the verb, predict the span and put that label on it, okay? So SRL, as I've defined it, prop bank SRL, is a pretty challenging problem. I'll show you more details on this later. I don't mean to claim there's been no progress on the task here. There's been great progress on lots of aspects of it. But if you look at the sort of core in-domain generalization number, for about 10 years, uh, there was not a lot of movement on this number. Actually, basically no movement. And so, what we'll, and, and, and one reason is because it's kind of, you know, a semantics hard problem. You've got to get PP attachment right. You've got to get coordination right. You've got to understand all this hard, complex structure in the sentence to actually get those, those edges correctly labeled. Um, but what we'll show you here is some pretty simple deep methods that actually get this number moving again. So we'll end up getting, you know, by the end of the talk, around 20, 30% error reductions. And, you know, by no means have we solved the task. We'll do a lot of error analysis to try to understand, you know, what, what's working and what's not. Uh, to, just going back to the sort of the, just one slide on related work. Uh, until about two years ago, if you were going to build an SRL system, you'd run an NLP pipeline. You'd run a parser, you'd build this whole tree, and you'd build, run a classifier that classifies different parts of that tree as saying this is probably a span, you know, this node here in this tree should be an argument of this type and so forth. There's a really nice uh, breakthrough in 2015 uh, by Zhu et al. out of uh, Baidu, where they showed for the first time that you can do more of this end-to-end -end approach. 
uh, with, with DeepLSTMs that I'm going to teach you in just a second. But roughly speaking, they were a little ahead of their time. We didn't really know how to train these networks too well, and the way they trained it was very sort of finicky and, and hard to replicate. Um, our contribution here was to actually simplify things even further. So we built very closely on what they did and created an even simpler network that I'm going to teach you just kind of in one slide in a second. Uh, that's a little bit more stable and actually works a bit better uh, and sort of set us on this directory of, uh, direction of thinking how much of this end-to-end -end learning can we do, how much can we simplify the models, uh, do they work better as you keep doing that. Okay? So the, the key idea, and you know, if you take an intro NLP class, uh, this should come as no surprise, is that you know, pretty much anything can be reduced back to a BIO tagging problem. So for SRL, we're going to say, okay, I know what verb I want to analyze. And I'm just going to tr treat it as a sequence modeling problem, just you know, vanilla intro stuff. So for the arg1, I'm going to have a, I'm going to say, okay, if I want this whole span to be arg0, I just have to mark the beginning that I'm still in it, I'm beginning something else, so forth, or I'm out. Right? Standard kind of BIO tagging scheme. And the amazing thing is that if you do BIO tagging for this problem, you formulate it as BIO tagging, and you train a pretty deep by LSTM with all the sorts of bells and whistles that have come out in the literature the last year or two you get a, a, a state-of-the-art model for SRL. So if you're used to doing neural models, you can kind of look at this slide. I didn't write the letters LSTM here, but you could have written those in. Just think LSTM when you see a blue box. Um, you basically stack a bunch of LSTMs, you run them back and forth, you add some extra connections, uh, and the whole thing works well. So uh, a little bit more details, by LSTM tagger. Because it's deep, you need highway connections, so these are these extra connections that span across different levels help with vanishing gradient. You need to be using the sort of the standard fanciest dropout that's been introduced in the last year or two. And then at the very top, you just, for each word independently, you have a soft max over tags. So this is very much how can we get the simplest model? How can we make strong independence assumptions? And here we're just independently picking the tag for each word. Okay, And a little caveat that I skipped over that I forgot, because we're doing it, running this network for each verb, we give it just a binary indicator on each word, is this the verb or not? So one of these words will have a one, and all the rest will have zeros on that binary indicator in the input. Okay. So you know that's that's the whole model in one slide. You train it with likelihood. You do backprop. It's roughly speaking, you know, other than the fact that it's deep and finicky to train, it's it's a very very simple approach. Okay. Um, here are some extra details uh, for the experts if you want to know some of the numbers. The only thing I really want to highlight here is that we'll, we'll present single model results and actual ensemble results. And so in the ensemble, what you do is you start from different initializations and you train five different models, uh, and then you just have them vote on what the prediction should be. And ensembling helps a lot in neural methods, and we'll see that in the actual results. We're gonna, uh, the cool thing about this paper, you know, Lu Hang did a really nice job of setting up and training this model. If you go and read the paper, it's at ACL in t this year, uh, 2017. It's kind of, you know, you the model's so simple, it's kind of one page to define the model, and then sort of six pages of error analysis. So I want to take you through the experiments and the error analysis and what we actually learned about it, but I can't possibly do all of that in the time I have, so I'm just going to kind of cherry pick some and encourage you to go look at the paper sort of if you want more details about it. But we, we did uh, sort of the two data sets that people typically do, the, the prop bank Connell data set and the Antinodes data set, which are of these sizes and have various properties. And here's what we actually see when we look at the results. So across the x-axis, I've got a bunch of systems. And you notice it's not linear in the years. So I've put the years on there. Um, we can do in-domain testing in blue and out-of-domain testing in green. OK, so in the out-of-domain scenario, you, you trained on, say, newspaper text, and you tested on something like novels. That's not too far away, but it is different. Um, and then we can group them on whether there's a sort of end-to-end -end by LSTM models or whether the sort of pipeline models that, that existed before. Okay. Uh, so I'll give you a second to look at this, but the nice thing that to notice overall is that we've kind of, we've broken that, the, the bar of those, those blue bars there. And we've started things moving again. Uh, and notice also out of domain that some of the earlier neural networks were pretty, were arguably overfit. They're not doing as well out of domain. But with the newer methods where we're fitting them a little bit better, uh, they seem to at least be having a reasonably constant gap. It's not that we're doing better out of domain, but we're not doing worse. Uh, so, so we're as overfit as any model is. OK, is one, one way to think about this. Okay. Um, the Antinodes data is a, a bit bigger, but it's multi-domain. So you see the same overall trend, uh, but, the, but, the, but the numbers are slightly lower overall. 
Maybe a slightly harder data set. Five, an ensemble of five. Uh, so, so actually, I didn't. I don't talk about computational efficiency here. We've we've improved this uh, since then, but when we were training the models for this paper, the the uh, this model took took about a week on a on a you know sort of good uh, gaming GPU. Um, and so, you know, it's just sort of how many GPUs do you have and how long do you want to wait? I, I bet you could get more gains with a bigger ensemble. We didn't, I don't know that we tried that super carefully. Okay. For your this like, it doesn't seem to, uh, so for the first one, you seem to get like four points in the domain. Mm hmm And only one point in the other domain. With respect to the other one. Is it fair to say that something about those other guys that are generalized is better than a little bit, yeah. I mean, I think a little bit. The, if you have intermediate structures, you could hope that would help you generalize better out of domain. And we'll come back and talk more about domain issues later. I think ultimately the right answer is going to be to label some more data in the domains you care about. But we can, we can come back and talk about that more later. Okay, so I'm going to try to, you know, we're going to have three models, and this is one of the three we'll go through in the talk. So I'll try to keep, keep the pace moving. Um, one interesting thing that I sort of forgot to mention earlier, but we can look back at the model. Um, if you do this model as it stands with the independent predictions of each tag, you'll actually get a state-of-the-art model, but it will do strange things, so it'll actually make BIO mistakes. So sometimes it will end things that you never started, or it will begin something when it's not supposed to. So if you, you get a really good model here, but if you actually just do a deterministic thing at the top, so you just say, okay, look, I'm going to do a Viterbi decoding just to make sure it's a valid BIO sequence. I put it on the slide, but I forgot to say it out loud. That actually gets you the, the final number, okay? And so we did a controlled experiment here to try to understand what was going on better, uh, where we looked at different depths. That's the x-axis. And the blue is just the, the independent predictions. And the green is where you do that Viterbi constraint to make sure it's a valid BIO sequence. And so interestingly, you know, this deep model can you know, improve the state of the art while making really simple mistakes, which is kind of hilarious when you think about it. And then you just go and correct those states and mistakes, and you get an even you know, much bigger gain. Jason? Uh, so the fact that you're going to do the perturbative decoding is not taken into account during training. That's right. Uh, but all of your training examples are valid. That's right. Uh, and to the That's right. So the, the, the Viterbi decoding is only at test time and not at train time. And it's just simple likelihood uh, independent for each thing at train time. But the data is clean. So I'm a little confused by, uh, on an earlier slide, I thought you said one of the prior papers did Viterbi decoding, whereas this paper did something we marked on that slide as parking constraints. That's right. So the, the previous paper was doing a CRF layer on top of the LSTM. And we're just doing this simple little trick. Thanks, yeah. OK. And you know, the shallower models, as the model goes deeper and deeper, you, know, you can see this gap is kind of shrinking. So there's sort of more, more to explore there in the future. But eight is kind of, in practice, the biggest that you're going to train uh, with the resources we had at the time. Um, we did some learning curves. You see some interesting behavior here. So we did the full model and turning off the various sort of highway connections and various dropouts and careful initializations that we sort of borrowed from the deep learning literature for how to train these models. Um, and also notice the x-axis is the number of training epochs. And actually, you know, it just sort of slowly ekes on up all the way out to 500 epochs, which is a behavior you don't usually see in other models. You sort of really have to train this thing out for a while, which is kind of interesting. Um, and if you, know, you don't uh, do that right, you start overfitting uh, and, and having weird things happen. And if you don't initialize it properly, it can take a while to get going and never actually recover. So this is wildly non-convex, it's, it's messy, uh, but nonetheless we seem to have a setting that's actually you know, stable and working if, if you follow sort of the tricks that we've done. Okay. And then the last thing I want to do is a little bit more of an error breakdown of looking where things get wrong, go wrong. So we can take on a, a dev set where we have labeled examples and we can say, okay, let's look at two particular types of errors. So labeling errors where, you know, say we did an arg0 instead of an arg1 and we just need to correct that to get it back. That's about 30% of the errors. And then you can also look at what you might call as, uh, you know, span errors. So, you know, you could say, well, what I need to do is take the two I predicted and, and merge them to get the gold span. Or maybe I, I over-predicted, I need to split it and so forth. And so you could look at those kind of what we'll call attachment errors uh, and see how you actually did. So I just want to do one slide of each of these and give you some feel for how the model's behaving. Okay? So on the labeling errors, this is a confusion matrix, which is purposefully quite small, and I don't actually expect you to scrutinize too much. 
uh, but you sort of you can see interesting trends coming out uh, in the confusion matrix of the labels. And in particular, I just want to highlight uh, an interesting phenomenon we saw, which is in prop bank arg2 is often confused with adjuncts like directions and locations and manners. And so, you know, if you're doing these kinds of models, you need to actually look at your data and think about it carefully, try to understand what's going on. So you can go and pull up those frame files for a lot of the verbs where you're having trouble. And if you look at the arg2, you'll see actually it often is a location or it often is something that's an instrument or a manner or something that you could do. And this actually has, you know, this is a well-known phenomenon. Uh, it's sort of, it's actually quite hard to decide whether something should be an argument or an adjunct in many cases, right? And if you re go back and reread the Penn Tree Bank Annotation Guide, you know, there's even whole you know, comments about this being tricky and maybe they didn't get it set up quite right and so forth. And so a lot of the errors that we're getting are actually just sort of fundamentally really hard things about the data, where it's maybe a little bit inconsistent and so forth. Um, and we're, or linguistic phenomena that are just really tricky. Uh, similarly, if you look at those kind of span uh, attachment errors, uh, you can say, well, we can correlate those with syntax. When do we mostly have span or attachment errors uh, given some gold syntax? And you find something here that's also not terribly surprising. Like the majority of those errors are PP attachment errors. Okay, PP attachment is hard. It's not like just applying deep learning is gonna magically solve that problem, right? It requires a lot of background knowledge and lexical semantics and other things. So you can go and look at the paper for a lot more details on this, uh, but, but the story I want is that we've made some progress, but it's not like we've magically solved all of the hard problems in semantics, right? So that these classically hard things like argument adjunct distinctions and PP detachments, that's still where we're making errors, and there needs to be some other story, some other way of getting world knowledge or something into these models to actually make progress there. That's right. But then when it comes to R2, I mean, we seem to be always, I mean, R2 and one word might be something completely different from R2 and another word. Yeah, and you can see that here in these examples. That's right. Should we do some clustering on which words the R2 has the same? Yeah. That's a great question. So should we somehow not be treating these arg2s as just all the same? You even notice sometimes they're marked, like in the, in the later versions, actually marked a little bit and subcategorized a little bit for their type. Um, and doing a model that actually has a fancier sort of representation of the roles and does better parameter tying across the verbs, I think is, is super doable. We've been looking a little bit in this area, and, and I'm pretty sure there's gains to be had there. Yeah. So even a simple thing like paying attention to these English glosses when you're doing the model and having some sort of uh, type level information in addition to token level information, that's something that we're really interested, we're sort of playing around with right now. And we suspect there's, there's really interesting gains to be had there. Nice thing is because you're doing a neural model, you can kind of embed it in the same space as anything else and, and it should be possible to generalize a bit better, we hope, fingers crossed. Okay. All right. So that's the story for SRL. And now what I want to do is, you know, quickly repeat the same story for coref. Of course, the model's going to look a bit different, but it'll have shockingly much in common. And we'll get this same story of kind of simplifying things, no parser in there, uh, getting results that actually work really well. So for coreference resolution, uh, the task is, uh, given a document, you know, find all of the mentions that refer to some entities and cluster them into groups that refer to the same entity in the world. So for example, this one is the group that's referring to the fire, whereas this one is the group that's referring to the actual building where the fire took place. And these are the, these are the victims and so forth. Okay? Uh, you can think of two sub-problems here, and we're going to try to do it jointly. So you can think of the problem of actually finding the mentions, and then the problem of, of clustering them as two different steps. They're often actually studied differently, but we'd like to do it jointly here. We're not the first to do it jointly, but with the end-to-end -end neural approach, uh, it's one of the first to try in that setting. Uh, previous work, often until very recently, you would build a co-ref system again with this NLP pipeline. So you would start, you'd run a parser, you'd use a bunch of hand-engineered rules to pull things out of the parser and get a big set of candidate mentions, uh, and then you'll run a, a fancy clustering algorithm to filter that and cluster them into the appropriate things. And of course, parsers have gotten better with deep learning, but within CoREF, most of the application of, of these kinds of methods has been on the, only on this last clustering step. And you sort of maintain this pipeline as it, as it stands uh, for most approaches. And so we'd like to be able to kind of simplify things, just go directly to the clusters, uh, and we'd like to, but we have to be able to replicate certain behaviors, so we've got to be able to find the mentions where the parser is being used, 
And you know, there's cer certain syntactic features like headwords that are coming out of these parsers which are really useful in CoGraph. And so if we're going to get rid of that, we need to get the model to learn that on its own and sort it all out. Okay, so this is going to be a challenge for getting a good model. Uh, I've kind of hinted at this already. We're doing this kind of end-to-end -end approach. We're just going to work directly in the space of all possible spans, all possible clusterings over them. And we're actually not going to do a beautiful model. We're actually just going to do a greedy approach where we're going like, to parameterize it as if it could make all those choices and then like, heavily prune it. Okay, and that's actually going to be okay. We're going to be able to get a very sort of brute force greedy approach to be tractable enough to work in practice. And the key idea, I won't take you through all the details of the model, but the key idea is that actually we're going to reuse a lot of the ideas from the SRL model. Okay, so we're going to have this, this common layer of these bi LSTMs just like before. But, uh, you know, in SRL, we put a little BIO tagger on top of it, right? This last little layer for doing BIO tagging. It's hard to think of how to do clustering as BIO tagging. And so instead, we're going to have sort of a custom layer on the top for, for clustering mentions, okay? So the step that we're going to need to do that, we're going to need to build a representation for a mention. And then once you have a representation for a mention, you'll be able to cluster it, okay? So I'm going to tell you a little bit about representation first and then come back to the algorithm. So fundamentally, when we think about representations, what we say is we need some vector to represent a whole phrase that we're going to build on top of these vectors that we've already got for representing the words. A common trick is to use what's called boundary representations. So what you would do is you would take the vector, the leftmost vector for that phrase, the rightmost vector for that phrase, and combine them in some way. We just concatenate them. Other people have done other things. OK, you're going to train this whole thing end to end anyways. So the model is going to be able to kind of sort out where to put the information. So we're going to concatenate them. Now, the, the, in CoRef, we have this extra thing. We need those extra sort of headword kind of features that came out of the parser. And this is where we're going to insert it in. So we're going to add a third thing that gets concatenated in. And the third thing is an is a attention mechanism that takes a linear combination of the words within that mention. OK, so this attention mechanism is going to add up these vectors. And it's going to learn to focus on particular words in that sum over others. And even though it's a very vanilla attention mechanism, I'll show you later in the experiments that it actually learn something that looks a lot like head words from a parser. Okay, and it's going to do that all kind of end to end. So it can kind of three things, the beginning, the end, and the attention. That's why we do the linear combination. No, it's a good question. It's a good question. Please don't, don't hesitate with the, with the clarifications and so forth. OK? And, uh, and then, of course, so that's, that's the key idea. That's the key wrinkle. We're going to do that, at least conceptually, for every possible span in the document. In practice, we're going to have some max lengths and do some aggressive pruning. But conceptually, we're doing it for every possible span. And then, you know, if, you know, if you've seen any CoRef, there's something called a mention ranking model. So in a mention ranking model, for each mention, you just have a discrete random variable that looks at all the previous mentions and chooses the one it likes the best. Okay? So we're going to take these span representations and we're going to put them into a mention ranking model, sort of the simplest way that you could think of, well, not the simplest, but a very simple way to convert it into a thing. So for example, this mention, the fire, could think about any possible mention before it. That's its space of a discrete random variable, and it's got to pick this particular one as the highest probability one. Uh, similarly, this one has got to pick this one, uh, so forth and so on. Okay? So we can formalize that by saying, look, reason over all possible spans. Uh, for each span, just put some ordering on them. And the third span has the choice of either not referring back to anything or referring to any of the spans before it. Okay? And you're just going to have this just very, very large number of random variables. But again, um, uh, the key idea is that, you know, we're going to make these really strong independence assumptions. So we're going to model each of these variables independently. We're not going to look at how they correlate with each other. Uh, and, and we'll just see how does that model work. This is sort of making these really strong independence assumptions. Uh, so here's um, a visualization of how that all looks on a single document. So, you know, if it's not a mention, it should get an epsilon. If it's a mention at the beginning, uh, then, it, then it gets this because it doesn't refer back to anything. And you only really know it's a mention because somebody else later refers back to it, and so forth and so on. And you can do the transitive closure and get the clusters out after you're done with this process. That's right. Yeah, so, so uh, we're big O, n to the fourth in document length. Not even sentence length. Yeah, so that's, that's like potentially very worrisome. 
Uh, I took out, there's a really nice set of slides. You can look at Kenton's original slide decks. Kenton figured out how to get all this to work. He's amazing. Um, uh, there's a really nice, uh, in his slides, sort of going through that end of the fourth and actually showing you know, visually how the pruning works and make it all work. But roughly speaking, the model is just kind of carefully factored so that you have, I'll, I'll show you the factoring on the next slide. Uh, and you get, basically get a score in the model for how good a mention is, and you just aggressively approve according to that score. You just cut out the vast majority of the mentions, and, and it works. So, so there, you're saying you're, cutting, you're pruning targets. You're saying for every span, you're going to decide, is it available as, targets for later, as a target for later span? Yeah, let me quickly go through this slide and then come back to it, because I think it'll be clearer once I do this slide. Um, so, so what you see at the top here is the independence assumption I was just going on and on about. The distribution factors as a product of distribution over individual random variables. Uh, the simplest way we can think of, of doing a discrete distribution is a softmax. So each one of those is just a softmax according to some score between a pair of mentions. Okay, so this would say, does I want to refer back to J? And we factored this score kind of carefully. So there's a component here which says, uh, are I and J good mentions? So this is a score in the reals that says, how good do I think a mention is? Is I a mention, is J a mention? And then there's another scoring component here that says, uh, is J a good antecedent for I? And then finally, a dummy score. So if these scores do not sum up to be greater than zero, you won't predict any antecedents at all. So we just kind of take out that one extra degree of freedom there. Now, all of these scores are just simple sort of feed-forward networks on top of the, the, those spans. Those, you share the span representations I taught you earlier, and then you, know, you stick a single span into this one, you stick a, a pair of spans into this one, and you get these scores. Okay, so that's the basic architecture and setup. The way the pruning works is you just use this score. So it's pretty easy to compute that. That's only kind of one pass of the LSTM. You can do that. It's only n squared. You compute that score for all the mentions, and you just greedily and aggressively prune according to it. But it's trained end-to-end -end and so forth. Okay? And that's all I have on the model. So ask questions about the model. If this is your chance. I'm going to results next. Uh, so one, one question that I started having about the model uh, is whether it could learn things like centering theory. Um, in other words, so, so for people who don't know what that is, the question is when you have a pronoun, uh, what earlier stuff is it likely to refer back to? And it's probably going to be, you know, he is going to refer or she is going to refer back to another thing, which is a recent subject. And one thing that I don't see here, but maybe the model somehow learns, uh, is something about the distance and syntactic relationship between I and J. But I don't see where it would be able to learn about that relationship in the Yeah. Relationship. So we do give it the distance between the spans as a feature. We add one or two extra features about speaker and distance. These are things that are either is the metadata or the document or easily computable on this document. So that helps a little bit with that. Right. But in learn things like the fact that they're both subjects, uh, because that could be part of the span representation. That's right. So any other feature has to come through the span representation. Now we know, I just showed you that a very similar architecture at the word level, not the span level, could do state-of-the-art on SRL. So those models have capacity to do stuff like that. Now whether it actually learned end-to-end -to, -end to do it or not, that's not something we've looked carefully enough at, and that's a really good question. Uh, they, I think it can do it, but whether it is is not so clear. So, so one thing that you probably can't learn uh, is C command, so you can't get the binding uh, yeah, I mean, uh, so think back to the SRL model again, making analogy to the SRL model. You know, it's, it's getting long distance dependencies really well, it's doing really good stuff. So, is there latent syntax in there of which you could get out something like C command? I wouldn't rule it out, but I certainly haven't shown it. Um, so, the reason that it's hard to imagine. Hmm? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, okay, keep moving. Okay, so let's look at some results. Uh, here's, you know, sort of the setup. Uh, not a lot of data in CoREF, uh, we aggressively prune. Uh, and we have a few extra features. Uh, so if you know the history of COREF, there was kind of uh, a few things going on. So right before here, a couple years, actually rule-based systems were winning. This was when machine learning came back and started winning again with some linear models. Uh, these are these neural models where your, the neural stuff is mostly in the clustering stage. So all of these results here are pipeline methods. Uh, and then here's how Kenton, how Kenton model performs. Uh, so you get a, a pretty nice bump uh, just on the single model, uh, and then of course ensembling seems to always help these neural models. Okay, so if you're willing to pay the effort, then you can get a pretty nice gain uh, there. Again, the paper is the model section is actually relatively short, and Kenton did a really nice job of doing lots of analysis. I can only give you a little hint at that. So uh, 
One nice thing is now you know they have that pruning score where we're thinking about pruning according to that to the unary factor. You can turn the knob there and get your sort of precision recall trade-off as a, a linear as a fraction of the a number of words in the document, and you get this sort of nice behavior. But notice that we're not perfect, so we can't actually get up to 100. We can't get all the mentions, but we can get an operating point on this curve that works actually pretty well. It works better than if you sort of had to hand engineer the mention detector yourself. And uh, the other big feature that I wanted to highlight in this model was that attention mechanism that looks inside of the span, right? And so for the attention mechanism, we can take gold syntax and we can say, how often does the thing that it's most paying attention to uh, agree with a syntactic head according to a tree bank? Okay, and that's what you're seeing here as a function of the length of the span. So as the span gets longer, it's gonna be harder to find the main head word for that span. And that's true, but overall it's actually doing quite well. You know? And we don't necessarily expect this number to be perfect because it's a soft mechanism. So it's not forced to choose a single word, it can actually spread its weight around and pay attention to different words. Uh, but it is actually correlated with syntax in a pretty interesting way in the post hoc analysis. Um, I'm 90% sure that's true. I'd have to double check with Kente, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that's right. Yeah, so the supervision that we assume is uh, clusters of mentions. Um, and just, so you know, just as a sanity check for both of these models, a, a point that Martha Palma always reminds me to say is that there's no, it's not that there's no syntax in these models because those mentions came from a tree bank, but it's just that we're not doing a pipeline. So there is even some syntax in that supervision, right? Because you have gold constituents as the mentions, but you're not using the full tree. You're just using a very light version of the data. Um, okay, so a little bit of qualitative analysis, and then I'll finish off the, mo the, the sort of uh, broad coverage semantics part and go talk about data a little bit more again. So here's a good example. You can't see the nuances in the color, but it actually is a little bit spread out around this head word, but it's noticing that fire and blaze should pay attention to each other. So we're both getting pretty good mentions even when they're long, and we're getting good head finding. Uh, but, but it makes some interesting errors. So I'll, I'll let you look at this error while I describe what, how I, my sort of post hoc understanding of how these models are working, which is that they're actually pretty heavily relying on word embeddings. So they're of course doing a lot of processing on top of them, but in so much as it has any background knowledge or any broader semantics, it's coming in from the word embeddings. And so that's where you see the kind of errors like this, where you know, flight, atten flight attendants and pilots are gonna have very similar distributional similarity, and the model's gonna really wanna cluster them together because it's kind of leaning on that background knowledge from the word embeddings too heavily. Okay, and so that's something we can come back and talk about in the next part of the talk, is could we actually do a little bit better job on these kinds of things? And we have some evidence that maybe you can. But this is sort of you know, getting background knowledge and common sense knowledge, again, just like before, you know, those are the hard challenges. You know, we haven't solved COREF, we've made some progress, but we don't really have a story for those bigger challenges. That's something we need to look at in the future. Word embeddings are always fixed or are they fine for, for this model, the word embeddings are pre-trained and fixed. That's right. Thanks, that's a detail I left out. Are there other questions? Yeah, good, sorry. The visualizations, I didn't, I didn't go through as carefully as I could have. The, the net is finding the box. That's the mention, and this is a visualization. Remember I said inside of this mechanism, there's an attention that averages those vec the, the word representations, and that's what the color is visualizing. So what is it paying attention to when it computes that average? So it predicted that span and did this particular averaging of the words inside of it in addition to the end representations. Okay. So that's, that's kind of the story. And going, jumping back up to our meme, you know, it's kind of surprising that we're making progress uh, by simplifying models without adding extra data. So they're kind of simpler in the sense that there's no pipeline, but they're not really, if you look at raw numbers of parameters or whatever, these are big, beefy models, right? There's lots of parameters and not a lot more data. And so, you know, it doesn't take kind of a deep insight to go back and now ask the question, like, what if we had a lot more data? Like, that's kind of how these things are supposed to work. You know, what if you had millions of examples or tens of millions of examples? Uh, I don't know how to do that yet, but it seems worth thinking about and worth talking about, right? And not just kind of only looking at numbers on existing data sets. So when you think about where the data could come from, there's lots of different answers. 
But uh, for the purposes of making this talk somewhat coherent, I picked two to focus on. Okay? And you could think, you know, what else could we do? And that, that's something which would be really fun to talk about during the rest of the day. So the first option is that actually I'm being a little unfair, and this came up in this discussion just at the end of the coref model. It's not really the case that we only have a little bit of data, right? Uh, and it's not really end-to-end -end training because I'm using pre-trained word embeddings, right? So I've trained those on a big corpus, and that's where we're getting a lot of, a lot of signal from that. Uh, so a natural question is, could we get even better semi-supervised signals? So could we somehow upgrade those word embeddings, or could we do something else with them? Uh, and is that a way of getting more data? And of course it is, but it, but it was not clear how far we'll be able to push it. And so I have a new section of results that you know, even the people who have seen all my papers don't have yet, because we have some breaking results I'm going to put in now that just came out like three weeks ago on a better way of doing word embeddings that actually pushes these models quite a lot. Okay? And so, so the, the faculty can pay more attention if they already knew the other models. Um, but the second part of the story, and I think there's great work here and other places on this, is like, uh, we should actually be trying to label more data, right? Like, this, come on, like, we just can't, we can't live with a small amount of data. And so the, the approach we're pushing here, which I'll come back and talk about later, is could we just crowdsource semantic supervision? It's going to be messier, it's not going to be as great as this very carefully engineered linguistic resources, but can we get signal from it, and how can we push it even further? And could we get up to much bigger, more, many orders of magnitude more? And this is a much more speculative thing where I don't have great results for these models I care about, like SRL and CoREF, but I have just some ideas and some, some very basic first steps showing that you can you know, reasonably annotate data. Okay, so that's, that's the path forward for the rest of the talk. Does it make sense? Okay. It's a good question. Um, uh, so the answer is no. Um, for, the, for the supervised data, for the SRL and CoREF, to the best of my knowledge, no. So they may have that they haven't told us about. Uh, I've talked to, for example, uh, folks at Google. They, they employ uh, 100 linguists. They need to cover many, many languages. And they do label more data, and they share it. So there's some great resources like web tree banks and stuff that they've shared. Um, but even for them, it's prohibitively expensive to go to big scale, unless they've done it somehow and not told us about it. Um, yeah, so, yeah, so Ben may know better than me. That maybe there is some stuff. And it, it would be a secret sauce if you had it, for sure. So it does not seem implausible that someone could have done it, but, but I'm not aware of it. And it, it would be very expensive if you did. Of course, they're operating on a slightly different scale than we are. So it's not impossible. That's a great question. So just to quickly paraphrase it to make sure I understood, is can't, for CoREF, can't we use, for example, Wikipedia links and other sources as uh, forms of supervision? Uh, the answer to that is you, you probably, we should be looking at that. And in general, definitely there's a third option here, which is kind of weak supervision, which I left off. Uh, but the, the, the trick is that's not a perfect proxy for the task I care about. Because I want to look within document and find what all the pronouns refer to. I want to find what all the, the nominals refer to. So that will give me good signal for like named entities and what to do with them. But it's only kind of partial supervision for the task, the full within single document task. And so sometimes that's called cross-document coref or named entity linking and so forth, uh, combinations of that. And undoubtedly, there would be signal to be had there. And I could give a whole talk about you know, weak supervision and so forth. It's a really interesting direction, but I'm kind of not focusing on that today. OK? All right. So now the, the, on to the word representations part of the talk. And this is where you know, this is brand new. And so I threw these together on the flight out. Uh, so you know, def you know, don't be shy about asking questions anywhere, but especially not here, because I'm sh pretty sure it's not clear. Um, but the key idea is that we want to actually switch from uh, word vector, like uh, word to vec or glove, where it's a lookup table, right? So in the previous work, you have a word, and you have a function that maps it to a single vector. And what I want to do instead now is compute a contextualized word embedding, OK? So what this is going to be is some uh, vector in the reals that depends on the word and the actual position that it appears in the sentence, OK? Um, and so, for example, the property that I want is that the word plays in these two different sentences has, you know, very different representations. So the syntax is different. Also, the word sense, the semantics is different. Could we, in a semi-supervised way, train a model on a ton of data that when we apply it to our end task that has less data, it's better able to make these kinds of distinctions? And would we get some gains from it? Okay. 
Uh, the, the answer is yes, and, and I'll show you how to do it now. Okay. So the cool thing here, and 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 sort of the you know why it's fun to stick this in this particular talk, is that we're just going <laughs> to keep using this architecture that I've been harping on. So we've got this BiLSTM. You put a BIO tagger, you get SRL. You've got the same thing. You put a little clustering model on top of it, you get coref. So now the question becomes, if I've got that same architecture and I want to do it semi-supervised on a lot of unlabeled data, what am I going to layer on top of it to actually get some supervision for training it? Well, you know, we use our favorite objective that we know how to compute on unlabeled data, which is a language model objective. Okay? So what we're going to do is slightly trickier. You know, we don't actually care so much about language modeling per se. Uh, so we're going to go both directions so we can get the context from both directions. And then we're going to sort of multitask a left to right language model and a right to left language model. So these representations that you're building for every word should be good at predicting the word before it and also the word after it. So it actually looks surprisingly like an objective you would see in Word Devec or Glove or some other thing. Uh, but it's also, you know, very, it's basically just a combined uh, two different language model objectives summed up. And you're going to optimize that on sort of as much data as you can. And for this one, we ran it kind of at Wikipedia scale. So it's pretty big, but it's certainly not the biggest you could go. And the actual details, uh, at the word level, we're going to have character convolutions, and then we're going to have two layers of this BiLSTM. Okay, and that's, that's kind of where we stopped for computational reasons, because sort of to train it at the scale we did, I don't remember the exact numbers. You can ask Matthew Peters at AI2 is the one that ran this project, but you know, think about, you know, say, three or four GPUs, three or four weeks of training kind of thing. So pretty big scale. What's the relation between the uh, compositional representations and words in blue? And the apparently non-compositional ones in green? Um, so the green ones are context. Are those also... So far, I haven't told you how this is going to be used in the... So what I'm telling you now is how to train this on the unsupervised data. And what I'll show you on a slide is how to actually use it in the end task. So right now, I've just kind of told you how to train a language model. Right, no, I, that's, that's not my question. Okay. What, what I mean is, uh, on the bottom, you apparently don't have any word embeddings except for the compositional ones. That's right. Uh, but when you're predicting the preceding and following words, what, what embeddings are you using for that? Oh, good. Sorry. It's just a softmax. I apologize. So that's just a softmax. So you do have word-specific things. But we're going to actually throw that away later. Yeah. yeah. So that's just a softmax. Thank you. That was, I missed the question. Okay. So now what we're going to do is we're going to we train this big thing on all the unlabeled data we want. Uh, there's computational limitations, but just conceptually. Um, and now I need to actually use that on some end task. So what I'm going to do is throw away that softmax layer. Okay. And then I'm going to say, uh, imagine this is some other, I should have made a, a separate test sentence that you didn't train on. You know, imagine this was your end task sentence. I'm going to take that end task sentence, I'm going to compute all these representations, and somehow I need to combine them. So the simplest thing you could do is say, OK, for the word said, I'll just take that vector up here at the top, and I'll use that as my word embedding. That actually works pretty well. We don't, I don't have the full set of results, uh, but that works pretty well. Uh, another thing that you can do is actually, for the word said, you can take a linear combination of these three vectors. Uh, sorry, so you can just average them. So you could just average those vectors and say, oh, let's actually peer inside the network and let's not lose that representation we learned. That works better. Okay? And what you actually do in this, what we're calling the embeddings from a language model, is you take a linear combination of those three representations for the word, with you know, just simple scalar weights, alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, those are just three real numbers. And you take a combination of them that's task specific. So you add three more parameters to your end task model, which already had tens of millions of parameters anyways. And you learn how to weight these different layers for that end task. You can backprop all the way into it. It's not, it's not that hard to learn. OK? Uh, and that's, that's actually the approach. So that's how it works. Yeah, so good question. So, and I actually could use a much better visualization of this. Um, but the way to think about this is everything down here, other than those alphas, are all fixed. This is all pre-trained on the unlabeled data and fixed. And that green vector should have a whole other stacked LSTM on top of it, right? Because that's the word representation for your task-specific model. So imagine I had a whole other LSTM going up into the ceiling, and those were the green vectors that were getting used for the words there. And in practice, you actually concatenate them. So you'll take, like, glove and you concatenate this vector onto it. Okay, is it clear? I could use a better visualization here. Uh, but, but hopefully it's clear what's going on. It's all fixed. 
So we're tuning that LSTM that goes above up to our end tasks. So for the SRL, it'll be the BIO tagger. For the coref, it'll be the clustering model. And we're just using this as our word vector that we're feeding into that higher level model. Uh, but you can backprop through that whole thing and just add these extra couple of parameters uh, to, to tune how to do it. Okay? And so this is really simple. It's very easy to do. And you know, it just really, really works well. Okay. No, please, don't be shy. All right. So the word to vec objective you could think of as not having this LSTM at all, just having this one vector and trying to predict a bigger context window. So the tricky thing here is that we're only predicting a local context, but we get to condition on a lot more. We're not just using that one vector you would use in word to vec. So the context is actually coming from the conditioning, and the, the learning objective is just very narrow in terms of the, the, the word where you're actually trying to predict. So it's an interesting trade-off. I suspect there's a lot more to be done here. Uh, I couldn't claim that we tried every possibility or that there couldn't be more to ring out of this. But it was an interesting trade-off for sure. Okay, so on to results. Um, here's how it does for SRL and coref, which are my favorite problems. Um, I'm being a little bit creative here and just you know, leaving out lots of bars. So I, what I'm showing you is the best feature-based. Of course, there are many systems in between here and here, uh, the best neural. And then what happens when you add these new embeddings just directly to this model with no other changes? Okay. Uh, similarly for Coref and for SRL, and you get these, just like, you know, you may not care, yeah, three points, that's nothing, but you know, if you work on these problems, these, these are very large gains. So, so, so I was kind of shocked to see gains like this from, from just changing the word representations. Okay. And uh, Matt, who did this work, is very exhaustive, and he pulled in some collaborators, and he said, well, how general is this result? So we ran it on uh, six different data sets, including SNLI, which is a textual entailment task, squad, which is a question answering task, the two I just told you, a three class NER, and the Stanford sentiment uh, tree bank at the sentence level. Um, and what I'm showing you here is blue is the previous state of the art. Green is our effort to replicate that, which can be surprisingly hard. And you can see we didn't actually succeed in all the cases. And then orange is when you add the embeddings to that, okay? And the nice thing is that even though we couldn't really quite get those green models up to the state of the art, we got, if you look at the gap between the green and the orange, the, between the middle and the rightmost one, we got some pretty nice gains in every case and we were able to bump up and sort of get state of the art on every single task with relatively, either we got base models that we could just download and run or we did a pretty simple re-implementation of them that wasn't, wasn't too too really difficult to tune, okay? So, so that's, that's where that stands. And now you can ask the question, um, you know, what's actually going on here? So how do we dive deeper and understand, you know, what is this model actually learning? Okay. And so this is actually also turned out shockingly well. Uh, Matt did a really nice job of doing this. And so we could ask, well, does the model learn semantics? So what we did is we said, okay, look, take those representations within the network, the outputs of the two LSTM layers, and try to use those vectors with no modification at all to do a supervised word sensitive evaluation task. So what we're going to do is we're just going to do nearest neighbor. So you'll compute the representations on the train set, compute the representations on the test, and when I have a word in test, I'll pick the instance of that word in train that's closest, and I'll predict its, its, its word sense. If you do that with the lower layer, it does reasonable. If you do it with the top layer, it's within a point basically of state of the art on the task. With no, you know, the, the model is completely trained uh, with the unsupervised language model objective. Okay? So it seems there's some interesting discrepancy there and some semantics is coming in higher up. You can ask the same question about syntax. So what if we train a little classifier on top of the representations to predict part of speech uh, with no other tuning, no other computations on the context, just directly on those vectors? You see the other thing happening, actually. So this is uh, not exactly state of the art for POS tagging, but this is a strong by LSTM CRF baseline. Uh, and the lower layer is actually getting very close to it, but the upper layer seems to have forgotten about the syntax. Uh, you know, you could try to generalize this to more layers. We're only able to train two here, but there's this interesting discrepancy going on. And actually what you're seeing in practice, now you can kind of maybe understand why those alphas made so much sense. So the idea is the task model gets to choose, do I want to average in more of the vectors that seem to be good at syntax or more of the vectors that seem to be good at semantics? And it can sort of learn to tweak and balance that on its own as needed for its end task. Okay. 
So for your auxiliary task, why wouldn't something like part of speech be helpful? I'm not sure why it's forgetting this, uh, but it looks useful. Yeah, so it's an open question, and like I say, this is kind of you know three-week-old results. I'd like to have a better story about why it's forgetting things. I actually don't have a good story for that. I mean, undoubtedly it has to do with limited capacity, something about language model objectives. Uh, for some reason, that's the right thing to do. It needs the syntax to get whatever it's got on the semantics, but doesn't actually need it then. It's not that it was, first of all, take this number into context, it's not like it's gone entirely. You know, majority, base, uh, majority baseline is 90 or something, right? You're still halfway there, but it's not there as strongly. And that's kind of interesting, and I don't totally understand it. It's possible that if you had a better neural architecture for doing the language model, this would go away, and you could just use the top vector. I mean, there's many, many different things that we don't fully understand here yet, but this is kind of an explanation for why this particular model seems to work this way. So, so one follow-up question, actually. The, the, uh, you're using a linear classifier, I think you said, to, or linear with softmatics, to predict the part of speech. And that's the same thing that you did to predict the previous index words? Essentially, yeah. Yeah, so it's not that, there is, uh, that the information is in there in some nonlinear way uh, where the training model can get it and this transfer model can't. The transfer model should be able to get it. I think so. Uh, if it were there. I think so. Thanks. Yeah. Huh. Good question. So, so, so anyways, the cool thing is it seems to be working really well and we have some sort of explanation for what's going on, but lots of work left to be done here. Uh, thanks. No, these are the me this, this is uh, this is the the embeddings from the language model. So this language model was trained. This was trained with the language model objective. So there's no SRL supervision, no uh, no coref supervision. There's no tuning of the embeddings for these tasks. This is like a post hoc. Like, can we understand what's in the vectors? So we fix those vectors and then just did these analyses on it. Yeah. So I think of this as my post hoc rationalization of what's going on. Um, OK. So then, uh, you know, uh, as predicted, you know, I'm going uh, a little bit slow because last time I gave this one too fast and I added extra slides. But that's the summary. Um, now the question is, you know, could we actually gather more data? And so I'll just give you a minute or two on this, give you a little bit of glimpse of this, uh, and, and it'll be something we can ask lots of questions about or talk about later in the day. Okay. So when you think about supervised learning, you know, if you think about this, uh, you know, say co-reference resolution. If I showed somebody two mentions, they could probably have an opinion about whether they should be in the same cluster, whether they refer to the same real-world stuff. Uh, but sort of as you go lower and lower down the NLP pipeline, like showing someone a mechanical Turk a phrase and asking if it's a noun phrase, or getting into the, some of the harder POS tagging decisions, it's actually very difficult. So our philosophy is going to be, can we do crowdsourcing? Can we, can we do it at the semantic level? So we're just going to try to annotate sort of very high level things about people's understanding of the language uh, and stay away from kind of trying to get a full analysis. But luckily, we just introduced a bunch of models that can train from semantic supervision only. So if we can crowdsource the semantics, maybe eventually we'll be able to just take those models, retrain it on that supervision, and get the whole thing to scale up to a really big scale. So we had a first version of this that's actually two years old now, so many of you have probably seen it before, but I'd just like to cover it again within the context of these models and things that we're doing. Uh, and so you know, we're going to look more at predicate argument structure here. So for the verbs, can we find all their arguments? This is the SRL task. And can we figure out how to actually, actually crowdsource that task? Uh, previously, when people did that, you had to use the prop bank frame files. I'll go a little quickly through this. There's sort of a lot of ontology engineering of updating those frame files. It can be quite tricky to learn to do this task. Um, but what we showed is that you could sort of reduce this task to sort of a question answering scheme. So if it really works in crowdsourcing, I should be able to teach it to you very quickly. So I'll try to do that now. So the idea is I, you're the annotator. I show you a sentence and a verb. And I say, what your task is to write a question that uses the verb and whose answer is some other phrase in the sentence. So you could say, who increased something? And you can answer a pronoun. Pronouns are a little tricky, but they can do it. Uh, you know, how mu what was increased? When was it increased? How much was something increased? And so forth. Okay? And so we showed that if you look at this, these question answer pairs, each one of those kind of corresponds to one of those edges you want in your predicate argument structure. But what we've given up is a really nice understanding of the labels. So they're labeled with questions. It's like sort of opaque. There's some paraphrase issues. But of course, Ben's group here with the proto roles is figuring out how to solve sort of the labeling challenge. There's, there's really great work, and other people are working on that. What much more focused on kind of what should the arguments should be and what should their spans be. So here's another example here. 
uh, where we're doing sort of a prototypical Wall Street Journal science. Okay, so this is sort of a feel for how this might go. I'm going to sort of skip over most of the numbers. We did a reasonable size data set. The costs and the speed are not perfect because we hired annotators hourly, but they're reasonable, and it was a first demonstration two years ago. Uh, we have now actually done this on Turk, and these numbers look much, much better. And I'd be happy to talk to people about that if they're interested. We're working on sort of some multitask learning across that. And we have sort of reasonable agreement uh, with existing resources, but not perfect. So the data is messier. It's not like we've sort of magically solved this problem, but there is a high correlation. And you know, building models that actually use it is an open challenge that we're actively working on. And here's just a little look at the confusion matrix. So if you remember those args uh, for prop bank, this is the WH word for the questions. And you see sort of uh, you know, who and what are kind of right up where you would expect them. And for example, locations are mostly where. But overall, is actually a little bit messy and quite a lot more bleeding than you might expect off the diagonal and so forth. right? So this data is not obviously easy to use, but it is, I would argue, interesting and, and important data. So that was the lightning fast kind of introduction to the, the data. Um, and so, you know, when we, we're doing this meme in reverse, now we say, okay, of course you should do the semi-supervised signal, and of course you should do weak supervision. You can get it from one of the questions earlier, but why don't we just also label some data? And so it's hard, it's not easy, but we're getting some indication that it should be possible, and this is the direction we really want to push going forward, okay? Um, so that's kind of giving you the bigger picture of where we're going. So to end the talk, here are some contributions. Uh, the models that I told you about, I've made those points enough. I just made the data points. Uh, and in the future, you know, we'd like to look at multitasking with everything under the sun. Uh, in theory, all of this I talked to you about today should work in any language. Of course, I haven't shown that. But in theory, it should. That's one nice thing about simplifying the pipeline. It's something we'd like to explore. Um, and we'd like to get a lot more data. So uh, at, Allen, at the Allen Institute for Artificial Intelligence, I'm running the Allen NLP project, and that also comes with a toolkit. So the SRL model's in there already, and by the end of the year, all of the models, all the training, and all the pre-trained representations, these really big things that actually take forever to train, are gonna be there under open licenses. You can even use it commercially if you want. So I encourage you to take a look at that, give us feedback, contribute to the project if you want, uh, and I'm happy to take questions now. For co -ref? Well, remember, so this is the top of the span representation. And then these span representations are put into basically a softmax that does a, a, a mention ranking model. So the, there's a, like a little thin clustering model on top of this. That's, that's a great question. Yeah, that's right. So, the, so, so if I could paraphrase that a little bit, you know, just having one linear combination, you know, noun phrases are long and they could have a lot of intermediate syntactic structure. You could imagine some hierarchical thing or building span representations on top of each other. I, I think it's interesting to explore. The philosophy in doing this work was to kind of try to reset and come up with the simplest model we could. Um, another place is, you know, these LSTMs, if you believe the attention is all you need story, those could also be replaced, and you could maybe get a little bit more interesting sort of hierarchical structure even bleeding out before you even get to the mentions. I think it's worthy of exploring. Um, the idea here was to keep things simple and look at common architectures, but I, I wouldn't try to make any sort of claim that this is the best architecture you could get for any of these problems at all. And I, 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 it seems likely that there are gains to be had with, with better architectures. So, so the question is, uh, why do I really care about semantic role labeling <laughs> as opposed to why do I care? Um, do you care about parsing? 
Do you care about relation extraction? Yeah, so... Yeah, why do you care about relation extraction? So, so this is a subjective thing. I personally believe that having these kind of uh, semantic structures are useful for lots of reasons. So imagine you want to do some reasoning on top of it. You want to fill a knowledge base. So that would be kind of the bare epsilon amount of reasoning because you're storing it for someone else to reason with later. But maybe you want to draw inferences. Maybe eventually you want to get the sort of quantifier scopes and you want to be able to say, read a science textbook and answer you know, SAT questions about it or something. The, the notion is that for many applications, you're going to need a structured representation that you can actually monkey with and do things on top of. And I think SRL is a for first step in that direction. Certainly not the whole story. Certainly not the only way to get there. Uh, I think there's a reasonable alternative hypothesis that you could just go end to end for every task you care about. But that requires a lot of data for every task you care about. And so the hope is that we'll show these kinds of representations generalizing better. Uh, the crowdsourcing that we want to do out of domain will be shared across all the end tasks that you want to do out of the domain. Um, and this seems to be a level we can crowdsource and so forth. But I would say that you, know, you could ask the same question about any core NLP method that builds a structured representation. Um, and we'll see how it turns out in the end. Yeah, so that's great. So the question is about kind of the goals of the Allen NLP project. Um, so we have a lot of goals. Uh, we're definitely trying to do really great work, uh, share it. Uh, but one goal is to do a much better job of building structured representations that you can do inference on top of. So the other teams, for example, have a mandate of doing, you know, they're really interested in doing science question answering. And they use SRL models because they need those structures. They do inference on top of it. And the models don't work very well because it's out of domain text. So it's science textbooks or something else. And the error rates are really high. And so I would love to close that gap. I would love to get models that, first of all, are better in domain. That's going to help. But they need to transfer that out of domain. I want a model that just kind of works out of the box on any text you feed into it. And if it's not working on that text, you can spend some money and label some data and make it actually work on that text. So it's more of a kind of practical in that sense. Uh, but you see sort of that actually fits really nicely with someone who has a goal of solving particular tasks that are already using these models, and they're not working well for them. Or not, they're working well enough that they use them. I mean, it impacts the numbers, but, but the error rates are really high, and you could, you, there's room for improvement. I think the paper does look at that a little bit, so how much is the pruning hurting you? Um, I don't have a crisp number on the top of my head, but, uh, but uh, you can look at that, and, and it is an issue. The pruning does hurt you. Uh, yeah, so the question is, could you do a fancier algorithm than just the brute force pruning? Um, and the answer is, we sure hope so, and we're trying. Probably not A-star, uh, probably something that looks more like a course-defined inference approach, but there, there, there must be something to be better done there. That's right, and it's, it's, it's really important. Uh, right, so the question is, maybe the embedding should be at the sentence level, and you can just kind of embed a sentence into a vector, uh, and you know, that's all you need, I guess, would be the, the implicit, if I understood correct. Um, you know, I, I, want to I'm really, I really like uh, Sam Bowman's work, and I'm really excited to see how far he can push it. Um, you know, to be honest, this, this isn't that philosophically different. I mean, the, the techniques that I'm doing are maybe, uh, you know, there's, there's differences. But you know, I'm arguing pretty strongly for phrase embeddings here. Um, and you know, f uh, you know, if you squint, a sentence is kind of like a very long phrase. <laughs> so, so maybe I'm arguing for a little bit more intermediate representation than some other people. But philosophically, the notion that you're kind of taking these bigger chunks and embedding them and doing things with them, I think, is very much in line. So, you know, maybe we'll use some sentence embeddings for different tasks. Uh, maybe we'll embed different things in different cases. But this philosophy of kind of getting chunks of text. Uh, computing various uh, representations of them and then doing very light things on top of it, I, I think this is compatible. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see for which tasks, which are the best way to do things. Okay, well, let's uh, thank Luke again for a great talk.